morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Thanks for coming out on a cold and rainy morning. But I kind of feel like the stories that we're going to hear this morning and the music that we're going to share and uh, the ceremony that we're going to go through together will warm us inside and out. So glad you're here. Thanks for coming. If you're a guest, we are really glad you're here. If you're traveling, we'll just ask God to bless you with traveling mercies. And if you're from in town, we're really thankful you're here. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to sit down and hear your story, tell you what God's doing in our story, and just share that together. In fact, after our services today, we have a, a lunch for new members and prospective members. If you want to join us, jump in. We'll be downstairs right after service is over. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in the service. And if there's a prayer request that you have, indicate that on the, on the card. You can write it out. If you wanted everybody to pray about it, we'll make sure everybody knows about it. If you want to keep it private, we'll keep it just to our shepherds and staff. But I'm really glad you're here. Let's stand. I'd like to have a prayer with us, and then we'll get on with our time of praise. Let's bow. Holy Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for coming to this planet in the person of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the humble way you came. You came in a way that wouldn't frighten us that wouldn't overwhelm us, and yet it does overwhelm us because you came as a baby. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for this season of the year when we can remember, rejoice, and feel renewed by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It came upon the midnight clear that glorious song of old from me.
which now the angels see, the splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light.
The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Be seated as we take our offering. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart for you. Open. lights this time of year. I don't know if you share that, but one of my favorite things about this Christmas season, I think, is to see the lights that appear everywhere. I put up lights every year in our home on the outside, and I will admit to you that I do not enjoy the putting up or the taking down, but I do enjoy the the Chevy Chase moment, you know, when the plug goes in and the lights come on. Light is transforming. You know, it just seems to me as I, as I pull into our neighborhood, right before Thanksgiving, there's a darkness, just kind of a, a standard run-of-the-meal feel to the, to the evening when you pull in. But as the Christmas season approaches, things begin to light up. It's as though light makes a difference, doesn't it? And and I'm just struck by the contrast between light and darkness. And I think that goes beyond just the the visual and the physical for us, doesn't it? I mean, I, I think, too, of the contrast between what the Bible calls light and darkness in terms of good and evil. And that's as old as mankind. In fact, if you've had a particularly difficult stretch in your life, you may well have said, that was a dark spot for me. We associate certain feelings with darkness that are a dramatic contrast to the feelings that we have for light. 
And I don't think there is a more dramatic picture of that than the cross, where light and darkness clashed. You know, Jesus said a number of times while he was on this earth that he is the light. We read some of that this morning, but John in his gospel later in chapter 8 and chapter 12 records these words of Jesus. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then he said, I have come into this world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. I think it's, it's interesting then that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record that during the time that Jesus hung on the cross, between about noon and three in the middle of the day, darkness fell over the entire land. And I got to believe to those who witnessed that, that their assessment would be darkness had won the day. But it did not, because three days later, Jesus walked out of the tomb and forever changed eternity for you and for me. And it's why I think John records those words that we read just a few minutes ago this morning. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We're going to participate in a short ceremony together now. We do this each Sunday here to celebrate and remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the light, and what that means to us. And so we're going to pass a piece of bread that is a reminder for us of the body that he gave on our behalf and a cup of juice that is a reminder for us of the blood that he shed that washes us of our sins. And we share this together today because we can celebrate that the light has come and that the darkness has not overcome it. And so let's pray together as we prepare for the bread. Father, thank you. We just give you praise for the light and life that we enjoy and experience in Jesus Christ. And Father, uh, this morning we remember that sacrifice. We, we just remember those dark, dark hours as he hung on the cross, as he gave his body as the perfect sacrifice once for all. And so as we eat this bread together, we remember and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Alleluia, Alleluia, Christ the Savior of the world, He has 
Thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sin, and we're so grateful for the sacrifice you gave on our behalf to rescue us from darkness and to welcome us into a marvelous light. As we drink this cup, we remember the blood of our precious Savior, and we thank you, Father, for saving us in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Christ the Savior of the world, He has come.
God, we are grateful that light has come. We give thanks that we now live in it. And we praise you for loving us enough to bring that light to us. May we all walk and live in it daily, especially as we consider this time of the year and the great blessing of the birth of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, would you stand and greet someone around you this morning, please? tried that turny thing the kids do and I almost fell down. Lisa says it's because of the viscosity of my inner ear fluids or something. I don't know. Hey, I just thought I'd sit today and tell you a story. Um, you can, uh, if you want to kind of follow along, you can turn over to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter one or chapter two, or as I like to call it, Matthew scene two. Um, I told this story a couple of years ago on a Wednesday night, but a lot of you weren't here <laughs> because it was a Wednesday night. <laughs> Never gets old. <laughs> We're going to have more to say about Wednesday nights in January. We got something cooking. It's not time to roll that out yet, but... 
Um, I'm going to ask you, we're going to ask you to kind of rethink some midweek commitments. So we'll get to that later. Um, December 1941 was about as bleak and dark as it could be because 19 days earlier on December 7th, 1941, 2,400 military people were killed when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Friday was the 77th anniversary of that event. Um, I can remember uh, my grandparents talking about that. Um, and they were, it was the biggest event of their lives. My grandmother would tell how my grandfather, and I've got a, a picture of my grandfather in my office, and he said, it's a silhouette, and he's just sitting in a rocking chair, which was his throne. Um, and she said he sat in the rocking chair and listened to the radio broadcasts all day long and just kept asking, Jane, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? It was devastating for folks like that. And so December that year was, was pretty rough. Um, not, not very many of us were alive. A few of us were in this room. But even fewer remember what those days were like. So it's good for us to go back and look at some history because there are lessons there. For days after the attack, they could hear tapping on the capsized hull of the USS Arizona. There were men trapped beneath the water, but there was no way to get to them. Um, one serviceman on the bottom side up, Oklahoma, was fared better than many. He had been clinging to pipes for days in the cold water, watching the men around him die. And then he heard the sound of an acetylene torch cutting through the hull. But he didn't know if it, were, it was Americans coming to save him or the enemy coming to finish him off. But he was rescued. Most of the sailors on those capsized ships were not. Divers would be bringing bodies up from the sunken ships all through December and January and February. And to this day, there are still many bodies trapped below the waves in Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, thousands of service men lay in hospital beds recovering from wounds, many of them severely burned or missing limbs or both. And in homes around the country, families waited for word from the Navy about their loved ones. And a lot of those families would hang gold stars in their homes, but not on a Christmas tree in a window in memory of their fallen sons and brothers and fathers. Around the nation that December, curfews were established and enforced. Shipyards and factories worked seven days a week, even on Christmas Day, all through the holidays. Neither the cadets at West Point nor the midshipmen at Annapolis were given furloughs. All furloughs were canceled. Um, basic training was accelerated. The, instead of celebrating the season uh, with all the lights that Todd talked about, the country was grieving and gearing up for war. On the other side of the Atlantic, Winston Churchill knew how Americans were feeling because beginning in September, uh, it's actually September the 7th, 1940, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, began a bombing campaign on London. And for 57 consecutive days, bombs dropped on London. By May 1941, 40,000 men, women, and children in London had died. 375,000 Londoners were left homeless. As devastating as Britain's losses were, though, Churchill knew that America was shocked and needed to be encouraged. It was his estimation that if America did not enter the war, the Allies would fall. And so 12 days before Christmas, he secretly made a flight along with a large entourage to the United States. The, the purpose of his mission, at least the one they stated, was that he was going to discuss war plans with FDR, but his real purpose in coming was to encourage Americans. He was well received by President Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt, 
And his, his visit, for, from his perspective, was a welcome retreat from the pressures that he'd been facing in London uh, for the war. But there were some things about Churchill that took some getting used to for the White House. Among them, his bathing habits, his drinking habits, and his cigars. Uh, he was convinced that a pint of champagne a day was good for him. And so early one afternoon, he was drinking champagne. And did I mention that it was early one afternoon? I always thought that was kind of a nighttime drink, but he was drinking early one afternoon, drinking champagne, smoking a cigar, and there was a knock at his door in the room he was staying at the White House. And his Scotland Yard escort, Tommy, went to see who it was. And when Tommy opened the door, it was President Roosevelt sitting there in his wheelchair. And when President Roosevelt peered around Tommy, he saw Churchill drinking his champagne, smoking his cigar, wearing a hat, but otherwise naked. <laughs> and Roosevelt wheeled his chair around to leave and, and Churchill said, no, no, Franklin, please come in. As you can see, I've got nothing to hide. So. We don't have that picture, so. <laughs> On Christmas Eve, thousands of people lined up along West Executive Avenue to go onto the South Lawn of the White House to witness the lighting of the National Christmas Tree, to sing carols, and maybe to hear a message from President Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill. Police told the crowds that they had to leave their purses their packages and their briefcases on the sidewalk for security reasons. Nobody complained. And in a testament to the unity that can be forged out of shared tragedy, when they came back, they found their purses, their packages, and their briefcases exactly where they'd left them undisturbed. Churchill had spent the last three months in total blackout conditions. And so when the tree lit up, his eyes welled with tears. And then he said to the people on the White House lawn, do everything you can to make sure your children enjoy the spirit of the night before we have to turn back to the stern work that lies ahead of us. Work we do to make sure our children can be free. Mrs. Roosevelt spent all Christmas Eve day handing out food baskets to the poor at various churches around the capital. She sent her staff out to buy gifts for Mr. Churchill and the 60 guests that he brought with him. And the White House staff worked feverishly preparing a state dinner, a Christmas dinner for the British delegation and the American hosts. On the other side of the world, Adolf Hitler sat in his log cabin retreat in East Prussia, brooding because his advance on Moscow had stalled within sight of the Kremlin because of minus 35 degree weather. His secretary entered the room with food for Hitler and a box to decorate a Christmas tree. Hitler took the food but sent the aid and the box out he was in no mood for decoration. And he ate alone under a stern portrait of Frederick the Great. But back in Washington, the British and the Americans were finishing up their dinner, enjoying one another's company, when they heard carolers on the White House lawn sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. There was one line in that song that captured the mood of the nation and of the night perfectly. It, it told the truth about how things were dark, but it gave hope that things could be different. But in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Let's sing that together. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shine the everlasting All the years are met in 
before Hitler tried to take over the world or Hirohito tried to conquer a continent or two, a ruler named Herod tried to secure his own throne and eliminate a rival. We've been living in Matthew's story of the birth of Jesus for the last couple of weeks as we talk about the promises of Christmas. And this morning, the story turns really dark. Matthew tells us that when Herod heard that a group of Eastern mystics had been asking around about a king and talking of having seen his star, he called in the chief priests to find out when the long-awaited and so-called Messiah was to be born. He wanted to know where, and they said Bethlehem. So he had the town, and now all he needed was the time. So he secretly met with the Magi to discover exactly when the baby was born, exactly when they'd seen this mysterious star marking the birth of his rival. And when they told him, he very coolly asked a favor. He said, go and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, report to me so that I too may go in worship. Well, they found Jesus. They worshiped him. They gave him their gifts. But God told them that going back to Herod was not in anybody's interests. And so they went home the long way, back to their own country. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. We'll let him pick up the story from there. When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. I was surprised when I learned this, but the border of Egypt was only about 80 miles from Bethlehem. I'd always thought it was like thousands of miles, but it was relatively close. We'd make that trip in a little while, an hour and a half or so. Joseph and Mary would have made it in a couple of days. They probably would have gone to Alexandria, Egypt. It was a little further into Egypt than the border, but there were over a million Jews living in Alexandria at the time, and it would have been a really good place to get lost in the crowd and to hide and to be among people who shared their values and their stories. So the angel told them to go to Egypt, and then he said, stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. That last part, that, that out of Egypt I called my son is a quote from the Old Testament prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1, I think. And when Hosea first spoke those words, he was obviously referring to Israel's deliverance from Egyptian oppression, what we call the Exodus. So why does Matthew call that prophecy, out of Egypt I called my son, why does he call that, those words a prophecy, a promise about Jesus? Do you mind if I go a little Greek nerd on you here for a second? The second word in Matthew's gospel, back in Matthew chapter 1, the, the second word he uses in Greek is the word genesios. It, it can be translated genealogy, generation, origin, beginning, or birth. Some of your versions will probably, the version you read may have one of those words very early in, in the, the first verse of Matthew. It can also be transliterated. You can take the, the Greek word and just turn it into an English word, Genesis, like the first book of the Bible. A lot of people think that the first book of the Bible, Genesis, is the story of how the world was created. It's not. It's not the story of how the world was created. It's the story of who created the world. So when Matthew uses this word Genesis in his very first sentence, I think he's telling us that Jesus is how God creates the world 
anew. So what does that have to do with this Hosea prophecy? Out of Egypt I called my son. Well, if Jesus is the new Genesis, then he's also the new Exodus. He's the way out of the old world of oppression and injustice and violence into the world of God's new creation. He is the Genesis and he is the Exodus. But here's the thing about the old world. It is very reluctant to give up its power. It doesn't want to let go. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders I have two grandsons. One is three and one is one. And I have one grandson who is still in his mother's womb. So I have a hard time reading this. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Herod failed to eliminate his rival, but the collateral damage was so horrific that Matthew had to borrow words from Jeremiah, Israel's saddest prophet, to try to describe it. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. You see those pictures of Jews being rounded up and then put on trains and hauled off to Nazi concentration camps. 500 years before Jesus, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar rounded up Jews to carry them off to Babylon. The town where he rounded them up was Ramah, the staging area. For that mass deportation was the town Matthew mentions. He's comparing the anguish the mothers of Bethlehem felt to that moment when the mothers in Ramah watched their children being carted off, never to be seen again, to be no more. The world feels very dangerous these days. Old powers flex their muscles. New enemies employ tactics that redefine brutality. Our leaders, both parties, seem completely incapable of solving the simplest domestic problems, not to mention the enormous geopolitical quagmires we find ourselves in. It all feels so very old. And oddly, there's good news in that. There's hope. We may not have been in exactly this place before, but we have been in places like this before, more than once. Evil people have always been willing to kill to get what they want or kill to keep what they have taken. It's not only the poor that we'll always have with us. Jesus said that. But we'll always have the wicked with us too. And sometimes they will enjoy enormous power. Christmas is a promise. Christmas is God's promise that the bullies of the world, whether they rule nations or walk the streets of your neighborhood or the hallway at your school or whether they sleep down the hall in your home. Christmas is the promise that the bullies of the world never get the last word. There is a light that shines in the dark streets of our lives. He shines forever. He has a name and his name is Jesus. God, thank you for the light that shines in the darkness. Thank you for the promise of Christmas that all of the people and all of the circumstances 
and all of the principalities and powers of this world that would bully us into submission do not get the last word. Thank you for the light who brings us out of our Egypts and sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of His hand. No ear may hear His coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive Him still, the dear Christ enters in. O oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We was a great service. It was a great message. Jody, thanks. I don't, you don't get to see all of the time and effort that Jody puts into his messages. Sometimes he is even especially passionate about something that he finds, some nugget, and that was the case this week. He was just really excited about this, poured himself into it, reworked it and reworked it. And sometimes he even comes in on odd hours just to kind of practice and make sure that he can be into and know what he's talking about, that he can be the characters and feel all that he needs to feel to do that. And that was the case this week. We were up here for Christmas play practice, and um, I went into the office, and I realized that his office light was on, the office lights were off. And so I wonder, well, I wonder what Jody's doing. And so I walked in, and I crept in, and I looked in his window, and there he sat. He was practicing. He had a hat on, a bottle of champagne, a cigar, <laughs> and he was naked. And I said, buddy, that's a little too much. I, I appreciate the work, but that's a little much. No, really, it was a great morning. Thanks for being here. A couple things as we close. I couldn't help myself. That was just too good. You know, there's a little bit of resemblance, too. I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm just going to say. Oh, today, as mentioned, that we get a new member lunch that will be happening as soon as we uh, conclude here in the fellowship hall downstairs. If you have been visiting and you want to know more about that, please stay for that. We're trying to gather hats and gloves for children at Chaffee Elementary right here in our community. And so if you can bring those by, hats and gloves for kids, we need those by next Sunday. Christmas bears are out. The Christmas bears are in the lobbies. They're hanging up everywhere. If you would take one of those cards and bring back a check or cash for $25, we're going to give those to local kids who have need right here in the Huntsville area, HICLC and other avenues that we have. So we need to get those picked up, and we need to get those back by next Sunday as well. You guys are going ice skating tonight. Good luck with that. Don't break anything. All right? Okay, good. Uh, children's ministry. Your kids are going caroling today. They're going to go eat pizza at CeCe's because it's such quality pizza at CeCe's. <laughs> And then they're going to go caroling at Magnolia Trace, which is a senior citizen facility over here behind us. So that's kindergarten through the fifth grade. Um, they'll be back here at 2 o'clock. The Christmas play is coming up. This is the last week. The Christmas play is Friday and Saturday. You were probably wondering why some of us were wearing matching shirts. That's not because we all got the same memo. That's because we we're promoting the Christmas play. This is the same logo that you would see in the bulletin. And we encourage you to come, and it's going to be fantastic. Encourage you to come and join us. It's going to be great. I need you to know there are only 10 tickets left for Friday night. And not much more than that for Saturday night. So if you don't have one, make sure that you pick up a Christmas play ticket today on your way out. I think that's it. I have talked long enough. Let's stand together. We're going to close in prayer. I hope you have an outstanding week.
Is it on? Yeah. Cool. So, uh, let's see. So we heard a lot about light today and a great message uh, about the past and the promise that's to come. And so I wanted to read something out of a revelation that uh, reads to that, that relates to that. Uh, and here John's, uh, he's talking about the new Jerusalem that's coming, the, you know, uh, when, when God has won and basically put away sin and death, it says, uh, I saw no temple in it, meaning in the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring the glory into it. In the daytime... For there will be no night, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And I mean, we won't need the sun, we'll have the light of God there. There will never be night or danger again. It's that promise that Jody was talking about fulfilled. I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, You know, there won't be any more bullies because those people that practice those kind of things won't be allowed into that city. Only those people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So if you'll you'll pray with me. Uh, God, uh, I pray that everyone here I pray that uh, all of our our loved ones and those that we care about, that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that uh, we live our lives in such a way, Lord, uh, that draw others to you. Um, If there are any areas of our lives, Lord, that there is darkness there, please shine a light on it and uh, clean that out. Let us live in the truth, uh, live in live in the love that you call us to love one another with. Um, And and, and no matter uh, what we're going through in our lives right now, Lord, help us to look forward to this day when when there will be no more darkness, there will be no more pain, there will be no more tears, for those old things will have passed away. And you will be the light, Lord, and all the nations will walk in that glory safely to you. In this your name we pray. Amen.